The End of Utopia by Russell Jacoby. Chapter 5. Thick Aestheticism and Thin Nativism. Has modern social and philosophical thought ended in doubt and confusion? Has the project of spreading light and liberty retreated to aestheticism and nativism? The roots of the modern critique extend back to Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, who tap earlier figures of the Enlightenment. Its liberating moment has not weakened. In the name of reality, the critique gives the lie to talk of equality, justice, and universal love. If all men are created equal, why are men enslaved? If justice prevails, why is injustice everywhere? If love is universal, why are some unloved? The claims of equality or justice turned out, turned out to be false, ideological camouflage for the powerful. The goal was to realize the ideas, however, not jettison them, as if injustice improves with cynicism. The notions of equality or universal love were not false in themselves. They were falsified by a reality that required changing. Criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers from the chain, wrote the young and still romantic Marx. Not in order that man shall continue to bear the chain without any fantasy or consolation, but so that he shall shake off the chain and cull the living flower. A generation of thinkers turned the critique against itself, arguing its, its exponents advance their own ideology or deceits. The difference between imaginary and real flowers collapsed. Any claim to truth or reality became suspect. The emergence of a new academic field, the sociology of knowledge, worked this out most emphatically. A survey of the discipline is aptly titled The Road to Suspicion. Contemporary critics and scholars inherit and redouble the suspicion. The project is not simply to unmask ideological claims as false, but to unmask the unmaskers. All categories deceive. All ideas falsify. This corrosive skepticism has become the conventional wisdom. Today, cynicism, the belief that ideas only serve power and repression, drives intellectual work. Truth is obsolete, appeals to it sound almost embarrassing. Around 1900, writes Peter Slaughter, Slaughter Dish, Dish, in his suggestive critique of cynical reason, the radical left wing caught up with the right wing cynicism. Out of the competition arose that twilight characteristic of the present, the mutual spying out of ideologies. For Slaughter Dijic, this is the real source of the contemporary intellectual exhaustion. The old ideas of truth stand at a loss before this cynicism. The new cynicism presents itself as that state of consciousness that follows the dissolution of naive ideologies. The flight from naivete into what Slaughter... Oh, fuck. Slaughter Dijic? Fuck. I'm so sorry calls ironic, pragmatic, and strategic realisms can be charted in much liberal and left contemporary thought, for instance, in that of the philosopher Richard Rorty, a self-described ironist. He might be called a post-end-of-ideology thinker, post because he surrenders the liberal ideas that the 1950 thinkers championed, even the ghost of utopia dissipates. Rorty may believe in liberal ideas in their future, but his belief lacks conviction. He cites the socialist Raymond Williams, who praised George Orwell as a man who fought for human dignity, freedom, and peace. I do not think, writes Rorty, that we liberals can now imagine a future of human dignity, freedom, and peace. We have no clear sense of how to get from the actual world to these theoretically possible worlds, and thus no clear idea of what to work for. For Rorty, this state of affairs must be accepted. It is not something we can remedy by a firmer resolve, or more transparent prose, or better philosophical accounts of man, truth, or history. It is just the way things happen to have fallen out. What remains of the philosophical project for an ironist? Not much. 
Terms like just or rational mean little beyond the language games of one's time. For Rorty, nothing can serve as a criticism of a final vocabulary save another such vocabulary. Since there is nothing beyond vocabularies which serves as a criterion of choice between them, criticism is a matter of looking on this picture and on that. As one of his harshest critics, Eugene Halton, puts in, Beneath the glamour of postmodern chic lies a dehumanized world reduced to unreal language conventions. This may be true, but does not quite capture what Rorty and some other liberal thinkers are up to. Nor does the charge of cynicism stick. This implies that liberals like, like Rorty and Michael Waltzer or Charles Taylor or Clifford Geertz are splenetic debunkers. Yet they appear open, bemused, tolerant, and thoughtful, and they are. Insofar as they have severed all links to utopian vision, however, aesthetic criteria come to the fore. Truth recedes before, pro before pose. What sounds interesting or feels sensible or looks provocative becomes the criterion. The break from universal and utopian categories leads to aesthet aesthetization. Oh, I lost my spawn. Oh, sorry. Is that is, yeah, aesthetization? An elevation of paradox, irony, and trivia, writes the German critic Hawk Brunghorst, or Brunkhorst. Interpretations compete on the basis of originality and cleverness. With half hearted protests, Rorty and the others say as much. They exchange truth for art appreciation. In Thick and Thin, Michael Walzer writes of the eclipse of the heroic mode in philosophy, the search for big truths. Rather, Walzer calls for the minimalist approach where critics respond in detail, thickly and idiomatically, to ordinary and local events. He suggests that we ought to understand this effort less by analogy with what philosophers do than by analogy with what poets, novelists, artists, and architects do. Rorty agrees and tell us that the, tells us that the liberal ironist turns away from social hope and social task toward private perfection. For this approach, what counts are novels and ethnologies, areas that specialize in thick descriptions of the private and idiosyncratic. The references to thick descriptions in Waltzer and Rorty allude to the work of anthropologist Geertz, who has championed the term. Geertz has had vast influence, not simply in anthropology, but in fields like history and literary theory. Already two decades ago, an intellectual historian, sorry, already two decades ago, intellectual historians dubbed Geertz their patron saint and peppered their writings with references to thick descriptions. The historian Dominic La Capra considers Geertz a guiding spirit of intellectual history. Today, many studies in cultural history begin with a bow to Geertz and thick descriptions. Thick descriptions sanctions layered portraits of singular events. It depreciates ambitious theories addressing broad issues, valuing instead modest observations describing small happenings. It encourages immersion in the stuff of everyday life, giving rise to history in anthropology that has more the feel of literature than of cold science. Yet Geertz adopts the term thick descriptions from one of the virtuosos of arid theorizing, the Oxford philosopher Gilbert Ryle, and perhaps the concept has the last laugh. Thick descriptions nourishes a literary approach. It also suggests the insular ruminations of self-satisfied professors. In introducing the concept, Geertz cites Ryle's example of three boys, one winking, another with a twitch, and a third parodying the winker. For superficial thinkers, these three boys all appear to be winking. For deep thinkers, however, a host of complexities emerges. Winker, twitcher, and parodist may be embedded in a dense relationship of communications and miscommunications. For instance, the original winker might actually have been fake winking to mislead others into imagining a conspiracy. As Ryle put it, 
The thinnest description of what the rehearsing parodist is doing is roughly the same as for the involuntary eyelid twitch, but its thick description is a many-layered sandwich, of which only the bottom slice is catered for by that thinnest description. Ryle offered other less than compelling examples of thick and thin descriptions like playing tennis, waiting for a train, humming and clearing one's throat. What is a thick description of throat clearing? I might clear my throat to give the false impression that I was about to sing. A thin description would miss the reference. The throat clearing is not a presence, is not a pretense throat clearing. It is a pretense throat clearing in preparation for singing. Or here is Ryle on golfing. Strolling across a golf course, we see a lot of pairs and fours of golfers playing one hole after another in a regular sequence. But now we see a single golfer with six golf balls in front of him hitting each of them. He then collects the balls and does it again. What is he doing? He is practicing approach shots. But what distinguishes a practice approach shot from a real one? Self-training. Training for what? Matches to come. The thick description of what he is engaged requires reference to future non-practice approach shots. Ryle spent his life meditating on such matters, an effort that Ernest Gellner long ago denounced as conspicuous triviality. The Oxford approach Gellner stated was perfect for gentlemen philosophers. To those unsettled by ideas or real problems, it gave something else to do. A student of philosophy at Oxford recalled that inconsequential examples characterized all discussions. In fact, there seemed some tacit competition to achieve the greatest possible triviality. Nor is it surprising that Ryle's examples are drawn from his everyday Oxford activities. An appreciation of Ryle bestows its highest praise by calling him an eminently clubbable man. For Geertz, Ryle's approach opens up many avenues, but the term may not escape its roots in the Oxford clubs. To illustrate its richness, Geertz provides a non-untypical excerpt from his field journals. His days in the field must have been quite eventful, for this typical selection reports a robbery and two murders with a vast cast of Moroccan Jews, Berbers, French troops, and several thousand sheep. The events offer much to chew on. For Geertz, they demonstrate that anthropology is an interpretative, interpretative activity akin to literary criticism requiring the classifying of texts. Here in our text, such sorting would begin with it distinguishing the three unlike frames of interpretation um, ingredient in the situation, Jewish, Berber, and French. Anthropology then is like literature an act of interpretation, even imagination. To construct actor-oriented descriptions of the involvements of a Berber chieftain, a Jewish merchant, and a French soldier with one another in 1912 Morocco is clearly an imaginative act, not all that different from constructing similar descriptions of, say, the involvements with one another of a provincial French doctor, his silly adulterous wife, and her feckless lover in a 19th century France. Geertz admits some differences. In Madame Bovary, the acts may never have happened. In Morocco, they are represented as actual. Nevertheless, that is not crucial. The conditions of their creation and the point of it differ, but the one is as much a fictio, a making, as the other. The difference between fictional representation and actual representation is not crucial for another reason. The Moroccan events may not have happened, at least, Geertz evinces no interest in them as facts. His 1968 field report records a story told by a Jewish merchant who must have been in his 80s about some events six decades earlier, prior to World War I. Can this account be believed in all respects? Even the greenest investigator would raise questions about a 60-year-old story of murder, robbery, and revenge. But Geertz never inquires whether any other accounts or records confirm these events. Facts are passé. Geertz offers no opinion about the trustworthiness of his informant. For Geertz, these questions are immaterial. He has a text ripe for a thick interpretation. Is this anthropology? Is this history? 
Historian Carlo Ginsberg has raised the question whether history can be written on the basis of a single witness or text. An account of a 14th century massacre of Jews in southern France comes down to us by way of a few lines left by a lone survivor. Can this report be trusted? Ginsberg argues that history is not like the legal process of indictment, which usually demands at least two witnesses. Sometimes only one witness exists, which the historian must use. No sensible historian would dismiss this evidence as intrinsically unacceptable. Yet this does not settle the matter. Ginsberg insists that the question of proof or truth does not go away even with a single witness. The historian must verify the sole account, alluding to those who challenge the existence of Nazi extermination camps. On the one hand, and those who advocate a literary history where fact and fiction merge, on the other, Ginsburg defends that old notion of reality. It is unfashionable, he recognizes, to argue for the connection among proofs, truth, and history. Nevertheless, the historical imperative remains the necessity of confirming the veracity of an account. The difference between history and fiction does not vanish. For Geertz, none of this matters. Yet his own thought hardly suggests cynicism. Like Rorty's, his style exudes a reflective bemusement as he moves from thought from thought as insight to thought as art. He is a modernist content to juggle perspectives and savor texts. There is no general story to be told, no synoptic picture to be had. Geertz writes in his recent intellectual autobiography, it is necessary then to be satisfied with swirls, conflections, and inconstant connections. Clouds collecting, clouds dispersing. What recommends or disrecommends his own contributions is their capacity to lead on to extended accounts, which, intersecting other accounts of other matters, widen their implications and deepen their hold. Geertz writes engaging essays that tell us that the world is complex and the best we can do is talk to our neighbors to figure out what they are up to. We ab he observes that the unitary approach to truth advanced by Matthew Arnold and some utopians has gone the way of adequate bathtubs and comfortable taxis. He calls for an ethnography of thought that reflects the enormous multiplicity of modern consciousness. This ethnography will deepen even further our sense of the radical variousness of the way we think now. His aim is to come up with an adequate vocabulary so that eco oh, holy fuck. econometricians, econometricians, epi epigraphers, cytochemists, and iconologists can give a credible account of themselves to one another. Geertz's forte is describing unique and specific events, yet pulled out from the larger context, the particular becomes not art, but spectacle, something to gaze upon. His often cited essay, Deep Play on Cockfighting in Bali, is a small tour de force, but it is as much a dazzling display of self as a penetrating discussion of its subject matter. Early in April of 1958 begins this essay. My wife and I arrived malarial and diffident in a Balinese village we intended as anthropologists to study. For Geert's cockfighting is a text. It is a Balinese reading of Balinese experience, a story they tell themselves about themselves and Geertz, the anthropologist, is straining to read over the shoulders of the Balinese. <clears throat> <coughs> but what does he find? For this diffident observer, everything evokes Shakespeare poetry and music. To call the wind a cripple, as Stephen does, to fix tone and manipulate timber, as Schoenberg does, or closer to our, ca our case, to picture an art critic as a dissolute bear, as Hogarth does, is to cross conceptual wires. The established conjunctions between objects and their qualities are altered and phenomena. Fall weather, melodic shape, or cultural journalism 
are clothed in signifiers which normally point to other referents. Similarly to connect and connect and connect. The collision of roosters with the divisiveness of status is to invite a transfer of perception. An aestheticism drenches everything. A danger Geertz's critics have noted. Thick description as Geertz actually practices it, writes the anthropologist Aletta Biersik, courts the danger of aestheticizing all domains. Geertz's semiotics concludes the historian Ronald G. Walters, risks losing gritty experience and elevating it to literature. Geertz views the anthropologist as an artist who cavorts with perspectives, writes the anthropologist Vincent Krapanz... Fuck. Krapanzano. Fuck. Krapanzano. Deep play offers only the constructed understanding of the constructed native's constructed point of view. His constructions of constructions of constructions appear to be little more than projections or blurrings. To be sure, there is no direct route out of the maze of interpretations. The problem is that Geertz seems happy to wander about. He puts it this way. The stance of, well, I, a middle-class, mid-20th century American, more or less standard male, went out to this place, talked to some people I could get to talk to me, and think things are sort of rather this way with them there. It's not a retreat. It's an advance. The advance should not be depreciated. Against a tradition of dreary theorizing, Geertz wandered the byways of Indonesia and Morocco, asking, looking, and reflecting. Yet the advance harbored the danger of retreat, the anthropologist content to view and amuse, not fathom. Benedict Anderson, a respectful critic of Geertz, cites a typical passage that begins this way. I talked to Jojo on the corner the other night about his marvelous grandfather. He said he was able to disappear magically. Anderson comments, this was a wholly new voice in anthropology and one that was to be widely imitated. The sympathetic, democratic American casually chats up a named individual, Jojo, on a street corner. The other night, as if he were a neighbor, rather than a scientist or a colonial investigator, he is happy to let Jojo speak about magic without contradicting him. Yet in recent years, continues Anderson, the description seems pleased with itself. Culture gets reified. Little is explained. Rather, culture turns into art appreciation. He quotes a marvelous portrayal of a Javanese celebration, which concludes the meaning of all this, just what was being said and unsaid by whom, to whom, with what purposes, in this parade of transgressions, bracketed with ritualisms from Marceau's BIP through UNESCO's language lessons to Lucky's speech in Godot, is fairly well obscure. It is very doubtful that any of the participants had even heard of any of these. Some years after Geertz finished his fieldwork in Bali, an unsuccessful communist coup led to bloody riots in Indonesia with numerous killings. In his piece on Balinese cockfighting, only the last footnote alludes to these events. And Geertz's language turns clumsy as if the grim political facts mangle his aestheticism. His contorted footnote in the penultimate page of his book referring to the coup, riots, and deaths begins this way. That what the cockfight has to say about Bali is not altogether without perceptions and the disquiet it expresses about the general pattern of Balinese life is not wholly without reason is attested by the fact that in two weeks in December 1965, during the upheavals following the unsuccessful coup in Jakarta, between 40 and 80,000 Balinese were killed, largely by one another. Geertz's other work, which tackled problems of Indonesian agriculture and state development, also tends to etherealize reality. His notion of the Bali state as a theater state, more devoted to spectacle than power, encourages a literary approach. As a Dutch scholar of Bali notes, Geertz's concept of the theater state leaves little room for the conflicts and the violence inherent in Balinese society. According to this anthropologist H. Schult Nordholt, the Princeton professor underrates power and leadership.
Yet the point is not to wield the hammer of political reality against efforts to look at small chunks of the world. The tiniest fragment can yield the sharpest insights. Conversely, the most expansive overview, overview can yield the most banal platitudes. Indeed, the categories of small and large deceive as if important thoughts derive from important subjects, and little ideas come from little subjects. It is not the size of the canvas that is at issue with Geertz or Rorty, but what they do with it. They are satisfied to sketch and paint, proposing minimal ideas about interpretation, diversity, and communication. Their pose is increasingly aesthetic. With and without the appeal to thick descriptions, literary and aesthetic modes enjoy vast popularity in the social sciences and humanities. In anthropology, history, and English, the talk is of tapestries of interpretations, imaginations of texts, the author is subject and poet, dialogic approaches. <clears throat> James Clifford, an anthropologist, writes that a literary and dialogical ethnology removes stability and objectivity. Subjectivity is the name of the game. The anthropologist's voice pervades and situates the analysis, and objective, distancing rhetoric is renounced. The anthropologist does not simply enunciate, but as a writer participates in the discourse about representation. Ernest Gellner, the late Cambridge University anthropologist, looked upon this with undisguised horror. Clifford, according to Gellner, has renounced studying other societies and cultures. Clifford is not interested in the Navajo or Newer or the Trobianders. He is interested in what anthropologists say about them. From there, it is a small step to study what Clifford says about what others say, to analyze the representation of the representation of the represented. And as Gellner notes, the step has been taken. For Gellner, this all makes for narcissistic, cloudy and deficient anthropology. What it means in literature does not concern me. What it means in literature is pertinent, however. The claim to be literary or poetic entails a renunciation of scientific truths. In return, the piece of work turns literary. Yet how do thick descriptions, instability, or multiple perspectives turn something into art or literature? Can art be reduced to the strategies and formulas these postmodernists claim? Do thick descriptions characterize Kafka's writings? Is Joyce dialogic? Even if some of the terms fit, they do not apprehend the essence of art. To put this differently, literary anthropology or history is not literature and does not read like literature. Hmm. <clears throat> um, I lost my spot. In fact, the postmodern scholars are usually less readable than the more scientific predecessors they disdain. Nor should readability be understood simplistically. Works of literature are not always easy to read. Yet no one can confuse Faulkner or Joyce with literary postmodernism, which is unreadable in a precise sense, jargon-filled and half-written. These writings signal not the affirmation, but the demise of literature. Seems a little dramatic. The issue, however, is not simply one of style. It concerns the categories of truth. Art, too, has its truth, but this is ignored. The new literary scholars extol an artistic approach that yields neither literature nor rigorous thinking about literature. The practitioners of a literary mode aestheticize, aestheticize reality. Art devolves into theories about art. Anthropologists become literary, historians imaginative. However, this is not art but its debased form, a pretense to be artistic, as if multiple perspectives and self-referential writings constitute art. Literary postmodernism is to literature as a postcard of a church is to religion. The new literary professors abandon truth for art, and art for art appreciation, in their rebellion against scientism, scient scientism 
They alter the values, but accept the terms. I don't know why this isn't working. Objective is bad. Subjective is good. In the name of subversion, they consign art to the reservation called subjectivity, in which it has long been imprisoned. Yet art is not simply subjectivity, multiple perspectives, and thick descriptions. It also partakes of truth and hints of freedom and happiness. For this reason, poets like Wordsworth protested the casual talk of art as a taste, as if poetry did not also partake of truth and insight. It is the language of men who speak of what they do not understand, wrote, wrote Wordsworth in the preface to lyrical ballads, who talk of poetry as a matter of amusement and idle pleasure, who will converse with us as gravely about a taste for poetry as they express it, as if it were a thing as indifferent as a taste for rope dancing. <clears throat> Wordsworth does not speak for all poets or artists, or for art itself. Yet he addressed a characteristic of art that the exponents of literary approaches hardly mention. It's truth. The object of poetry, he stated, is truth, not individual and local, but general and operative, not standing upon external testimony, but carried alive into the heart, heart by passion. Truth, which is its own testimony, which gives strength and divinity to the tribunal to which it appeals. Many scholars and academics have not only prospered in the marginality business, they have unloaded old, slow-selling stock. In the, close out, in the close-out sale, they drastically mark down concepts that hint of old-world enlightenment or out-of-the-world utopia. The new lines dispense with bulky, uh, bulky universals and one-size-fits-all engineering. Designed for local markets, the new items are smaller, easier to handle, neater. A preference for the local and the specific is benign, even salutary. What is wrong with favoring the unique and distrusting universals? In the short run, nothing. Yet over time, the suspicion of universals takes its revenge. Despite a rhetoric of subversion, it leads intellectuals down the path of acquiescence. Without an emphatic idea of freedom and happiness, a better society can scarcely be envisioned. Utopia withers. Those who celebrate difference and discredit universals cannot think beyond the limited possibilities tossed up by history. At best, they appreciate anything unique or non-Western. At worst, they mythologize questionable practices. They also relinquish the willingness to judge. Divested of a resolute idea of truth, political thinking turns murky. The new professors brag of their theoretical daring, but revel in unclarity. They confuse profundity and complexity. Proponents of cutting-edge theories do not acknowledge complexity as a stage in the process of thinking, or recognize ambiguities as constituent of life and its society. These become the goal or conclusion, proof of theoretical acumen. Hmm. To be sure, the issues preclude a brief discussion. All philosophy attends to the relationship of universals and particulars, which no formula can govern. In the domain of morality and politics, the problems are no less dense. Do universal codes of justice and rights exist? And if they do, should they be used to criticize specific practices and acts? A case like that of Salman Rushdie, the English Indian author, focuses the theoretical issues in as much as it seems to set a universal idea of human rights against the particular beliefs of several Islamic nations. His 1988 novel, Satanic Verses, provoked riots in India and censorship in several countries. Iran's leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, issued a death sentence to Rushdie and all those involved in the publication of the book. I call on all zealots, or sorry, I call on all zealous Muslims to execute them quickly, 
wherever they may be found, so that no one else will dare to insult the Muslim sanctities. To encourage the deed, heavenly defenders of the faith offered a secular million dollars to the successful assassin or assassins. Since then, Rushdie has lived in seclusion with armed bodyguards, which has done little to curb the casualties among his translators and editors. In Japan, a translator was murdered. In Italy, a translator received life-threatening injuries. And in Turkey, 37 people were killed in a terrorist incendiary attack on an editor who published the satanic verses in his newspaper, reports William Nigard, Rushdie's Norwegian publisher, who himself was seriously wounded in an assassination attempt. If the Rushdie affair were a test, however, many Western intellectuals would flunk. <clears throat> As Robert Hughes has stated, American academics failed to collectively protest, and he supposed this neglect was due to a politically correct relativism, the argument that what they do in the Middle East is their culture. This may be unfair, yet the writings on Rushdie by leftist academics are cautious to a fault. Confronted with sharply etched conflict, militant intellectuals with supercharged concepts reach for jargon and platitudes. Uh, the point is not that intellectuals come out on the wrong side in the Rushdie affair. They come out on no side. <clears throat> This is even true for some of the best and most lucid thinkers, like Charles Taylor, who frets that a Western standard of liberty may be inappropriate in the Rushdie dispute. It goes without saying that there should be full freedom of publication, Taylor forthrightly states and forthrightly retracts. That applies to us, meaning North Americans and Europeans. In India, Iran, and elsewhere, other imperatives intrude. Perhaps no abstract principle of freedom applies. Diverse societies judge diversely what defines blasphemy and heinous insults. To stand above and outside local conditions with a single criteria implicitly endorses the superiority of the West. That sounds weirdly familiar. I believe it is misguided to claim to identify culture-independent criteria of harm, he states. Where do these judicious thoughts lead Taylor? Nowhere. Since there is no universal definition of freedom of expression, he argues, we are going to have to live with this pluralism. That means accepting solutions for one country which don't apply in another. Faced with a state-sponsored plan to assassinate a novelist, this stalwart liberal philosopher calls for acceptance and some degree of understanding. He closes his reflections on Rushdie with mind-numbing cliches. To live in this difficult world, the Western liberal mind will have to learn to reach out more. <laughs> it's so hokey. If the best say little, the others say less. In a brief overview of the controversy about satanic verses, Vijay Mishra and Bob Hodge, two professors of literature, summarize a half dozen discussions of Rushdie and reach the ringing conclusion. Here is the crux of the matter. The moment the dominant culture itself begins to draw generic lines, fiction, history, politics, and postmodern play, the text gets transformed into distinct objects with distinct effects and meanings. In political terms, <clears throat> The satanic verses ceases to be post-colonial and becomes post-modern. Even this statement seems too audacious in the author's retreat, noting that another stalwart theorist in a suggestive essay shows how the book is post-modern and post-colonial at the same time. Jim Jim Mc McGugan raises the issue of how the left liberal intelligentsia did and should respond to the Rushdie affair. After surveying the principal players, he gets no further than calling for dialogue. 
This is especially urgent since Rushdie's own formation, predominantly within Western elite culture, did indeed separate him rather sharply from the popular culture of Islamic communities in Britain and elsewhere. As McGugan sees it, Rushdie failed to communicate. The fact of the matter is that the Satanic Verses was never addressed to ordinary British Muslims, as if a novel needs popular ratification or its author should be executed. McGugan caps his discussion with postmodern homilies, calling for self-consciousness about the interpreted interpretative project itself. I don't like that word. Garachi C. Spivak devotes an essay to the Rushdie affair that nimbly avoids any lucidity. In her inimitable, in, inimitable style, she cites her inimitable style. <coughs> Faced with the case of Salman Rushdie, how are we to read? I have often said and said again in chapter 2 that the tragic theatre of the sometimes farcically self-indulgent script of post-structuralism is the other side. To nail down these statements, she throws into the Rushdie controversy an account of Shabano, a divorced Indian Muslim woman who sued for financial support from her ex-husband. To Hindu applause... <clears throat> <clears throat> to Hindu sub- to sorry to Hindu applause the Indian Supreme Court found in her favor but Shabano in a change of heart protested the verdict in the name of Islam to Spivak this involuted case illuminates the rush to the affair once again I emphasize the implausible connection by reversal the simulated Kamini as author and the dissimulated Shibano marking the place of the effaced trace at the origin, an invocation of a collective support projecting a singular agent filled with divine intention, an invocation of collective resistance displacing a censor patient as cross-hatched by discursivities, discursivit, discursivities. She adds, as if these sentences were not already sufficiently incisive, it is only if we recognize that we cannot, cannot not want freedom of expression, as well as those other normative and privative rational abstractions, that we on the other side can see how they work as alibis. It is only then that we can recode the conflict as racism versus fundamentalism, demonizing versus disavowal. The inability to write a sentence and the inability to make a frank political judgment might be related. This surfaces not simply in major conflicts like that of Rushdie, but also in small matters. Wendy Brown, a feminist political theorist, recounts that in her very liberal university town, Santa Cruz, California, the governing council considered a new ordinance banning discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, um transsexuality, age, height, weight, personal appearance, physical characteristics, race, color, creed, religion, national origin, ancestry, disability, marital status, sex, or gender. This would seem to cover all bases, but the law drives Brown into a theoretical rage, not because it, e not because it evidences liberalism amok, but domination unleashed. The soapy-headed denizens of Santa Cruz forgot their Foucault, according to Professor Brown. The law reduces people to empirical traits, as if their existence were intrinsic and factual, rather than effects of discursive and institutional power. Did the lawmakers do their theoretical homework? Here is a perfect instance of how the language of recognition becomes the language of unfreedom, how articulation in language, in the context of liberal and disciplinary discourse, becomes a vehicle of subordination. This bold thinker finds a disaster in Santa Cruz. This ordinance, I want to suggest, is symptomatic of a feature of politicized identities desire within liberal bureaucratic regimes, its foreclosure of its own freedom, 
its impulse to inscribe in the law and in other political registers its historical and present pain, rather than conjure an imagined future of power to make itself. I feel like applauding after that quotation, actually, (laughs) to be perfectly honest with you. Anyway... A flight from universals, driven by simplistic notions of power in history, cripples political thinking. At the end of the 20th century, vanguard thinkers hawk the most elementary ideas as revolutionary breakthroughs. The notion that history is complex is presented as late news. The idea that many perspectives constitute the world is discovered afresh. All this is written up in the clotted language of the new academics, who often deride coherency as inescapably repressive. The demand for coherence, write a feminist theorist, requires the exclusion of any elements such as ambiguity, conflict, and contradiction, which threaten coherence. As if Marx or Hegel did not discuss conflict coherently, Janet R. Jacobson, who teaches women's studies, continues in the famous style of post-coherent thinkers, illustrating her point. I am not simply inciting a discourse which somehow focuses on all differences simultaneously, a move with universalizing tendencies that can reinstate a singular discourse by subsuming multiple sites of struggle. Rather, I am suggesting that by reading from multiplicity, and ambivalence, it might be possible to articulate the intersectionality of differences, the points at which multiple processes of social differentiation come together to form nexuses of oppressions, as well as spaces in between the chasms of differentiation. Leftist thinkers monomaniacally extend the truism that power is powerful to the proposition that power is everything, as if there were a subversive notion as if this were a subversive notion. In this book goes a typical sentence by two cultural studies practitioners. We make the scandalous claim, everything in social and cultural life is fundamentally to do with power. Power is at the center of cultural politics. We are either active subjects or we are subjected to others. Scandalous claim? This is the wisdom of executive suites in abandoned streets. Money talks. The bottom line is, you're either with us or against us. It's who you know. <clears throat> the belief engenders a vision of the world of insiders and outsiders. Those on top and those on bottom. All beyond good and evil. If history were only the story of contending power cliques, then every chapter would begin with a power struggle and end in blood which is almost the case. (coughs) Those out of power offer the same program as those in power, except they list different individuals to be shot or imprisoned. That this is a recurring tale does not transform a truth into a critique. Foucault redoubled the cynicism with his idea of total, not partial power. Those who follow Foucault scrap as two limited notions of power in politics defined by the state. Rather, power expands to encompass all domains, including concepts, rules, representations, and categories. Power and politics saturate everything. Truth itself is a function of power. Truth is what counts as true with the system of rules for a particular discourse, write several exponents of post-colonial literature. Power is that which annexes, determines, and verifies truth. Truth is never outside power. To say that everything is political, stated Foucault, is to affirm this ubiquity of relations of force to the vast new techniques of power correlated with multinational economies and bureaucratic states. One must oppose a politicization which will take new forms. In this approach, utopia is another name for domination. Historians of ideas usually attribute the dream of a perfect society to philosophers and jurists of the 18th century wrote Foucault, but there was also a military dream of society, of meticulously subordinated cogs of a machine. The search for omnipresent power inspires some original research. It also opens the floodgates to demi-scholarship that endlessly rediscovers power. Traditionally, political thinking began, not ended, with the recognition of power. 
Now the fact of power appears as a dazzling insight. The third chapter of Rousseau's social contract questioned the right of the strongest. As Rousseau put it, the phrase is nonsense. To yield to force is an act of necessity. No arguments need be adduced to make you hand over your purse to pistol-packing robbers. But where is the right? If force creates right, the effect changes with the cause. Every force that is greater than the first succeeds to its right. But what kind of right is that which perishes when force fails? The ability to distinguish what is and what should be, the sine qua non of political thinking, dwindles. The reality of a multifarious domination stuns liberal and leftist thinkers into reiterating the platitude that all categories deceive. A political theorist derides impartiality as a cloak for power. The idea of impartiality, writes Iris M. Young, legitimates hierarchical decision-making and allows the standpoint of the privileged to appear as universal. And as much as impartiality is rarely impartial, it never is and should be shelved. All universal categories serve as tools of power in history. Since they are not uniformly realized, they are false. Banal ideas of history supplement banal ideas of power. Critics incessantly observe that global intellectual diversity proves no idea is truer than any other, as if the fact of slavery justified its practice. The late bourgeois mind, Adorno, proclaimed, is unable to comprehend validity and genesis and their simultaneous unity and difference. To put this more crudely, the reality that all thought originates somewhere, genesis, does not constitute an argument for its falseness, validity. Nor is something invalid because it is not generally recognized or because it is misused. This may seem obvious, but left-leaning scholars regularly argue that global power and complexity disprove universals. The concept of universalism, state the editors of an anthology of a marginalized literature, excludes the colonialized peoples. The myth of universality is thus a primary strategy of imperial control. The assumption of universalism is a fundamental feature of the construction of a colonial power because the universal features of humanity are the characteristics of those who occupy positions of political dominance. The ideas fall upon receptive ears. These same editors anthologize an essay of the Nigerian novelist Chinwa Akibi, in which he angrily charges that Western literature is often considered universal, while African literature is not. I should like to see the word universal banned altogether from discussions of African literature until such a time as people cease to use it as a synonym for the narrow, self-serving parochialism of Europe. In regard to music or poetry or fiction, these sentiments could be easily multiplied. Artists or writers of South America or Africa or Asia rightly object to being considered less than universal. The extension of this criticism from art to politics, philosophy, and sciences is questionable, however. Although music or poetry may be culturally specific, this is less true for scientific axioms and philosophic principles. Are human rights invalid because they are violated or ignored or unknown? If they are not recognized, does this make them false? The truth is also valid for those who contradict it, ignore it, or declare it unimportant, stated Max Horkheimer on behalf of a notion al almost obsolete. To the modern academic, empirical diversity signifies multiple truths. Imperialism spawns universal truths. Human rights states an anthropologist and Belinda S. Price are culturally constructed. Observer and observed participate in a complex reality. What does this mean? There is no objective position from which human rights can be truly measured. And the conclusion? This ought to fundamentally challenge the current practice of establishing human rights records of particular states by organizations such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the International Commission of Jurists. Because such evaluations are always inherently partial, committed, and incomplete. One vigilant anti-imperialistic scholar attacks Western mathematics as the secret weapon of cultural imperialism. The reasoning is familiar, though it claims universalism. 
Western mathematics is really a tool of domination and control. With the assumptions of universality and cultural neutrality, Western mathematics has been imposed on the indigenous cultures. However, the world has produced other equally valid systems of computation. All cultures have generated mathematical ideas, just as all cultures have generated language, religion, morals, customs, and kinship systems. According to Alan Bishop, a professor of education, alternative mathematical systems exist. For instance, in Papua New Guinea, some 600 systems of counting have been reported, including finger counting, body pointing, knotted strings, beads, and so on. This suggests we should recognize ethnomathematics as a more localized and specific set of mathematical ideas outside or against mainstream mathematics. I don't think I get that. Um, Another adherent of ethnomathematics denounces the Eurocentric approach with its pretense of universality. Marcello C. Borba, a mathematics educator, writes that European mathematics is an historical construction representing the codes and understandings of Western academics. In fact, only a small percentage of the world's population uses it. Therefore, academic mathematics is not universal. Much better is ethnomathematics, developed by diverse cultures. Local arithmetic surpasses academic academic mathematics because the ethnomathematics developed by a given culture group is linked to the obstacles which have emerged in this group. Empirical Empirical observations of diverse mathematical and scientific practices across the globe can hardly be challenged. The conclusion that each society can and should have its own unique mathematics does not follow, and the notion that local obstacles inexplicably yield effective solutions is delusional. Mira Nanda, a science writer, protests the intellectual and political consequences of this position. It undermines cosmopolitanism and encourages dubious politics. She cites Abdus Salam, the Pakistani Nobel laureate in physics, affirming the universality of science. There is no such thing as Islamic science, just as there is no Hindu science, no Jewish science, no Confucian science, nor indeed Western science. Nanda, who is from India, finds that the criticism of scientific universalism reinforces the most retrograde tendencies and groups. Hindu nationalism in my native India has definitely benefited from the cultural climate in which even supposedly left-inclined intellectuals and activists tend to treat all liberal and modern ideas as Western, unauthentic, and thus inappropriate for India. She notes the sad irony of the most radical cutting-edge thinkers in the West giving intellectual ammunition to our nativists. From here, it is a small jump to the Sokal Bruhaha, an intellectual event that fed or fed off of the idea of science as less than universal. In 1996, a New York University physicist published in a leading journal of cultural studies, social text, a long article that called for new mathematics and physics. With great panache and learning, Alan Sokal attacked the dogma still prevalent among scientists that there exists an external world whose properties can be codified in universal laws. Instead, he proposed a postmodern science that recognizes multiple truths and approaches. A simple criterion for science to qualify as postmodern wrote Sokal, citing another authority, is that it be free from any dependence on the concept of objective truth. Like art and philosophy, he argued all science is historical, yet yet few scientists admit this fact. Rather, they cling to the dogma imposed by the post-enlightenment hegemony over the Western intellectual, in which there exists an external world whose properties are independent of any individual human being. Unfortunately, scientists still believe that human beings can obtain reliable knowledge of this world through objective procedures. After quoting Derrida on Einstein, 
the author gave an example of the historical approach and space-time point can be transformed into any other, eroding the distinction between observer and observed. The pi of Euclid and the g of Newton, or gravity, I think that would, be, that would mean, formerly thought to be constant and universal, are now perceived in their ineluctable historicity. Sokal closed by calling for a new emancipatory mathematics, seconding those feminist thinkers who have denounced Western mathematics as capitalist, patriarchal, and militaristic. The piece was a hoax. As a leftist and a physicist, Sokal wanted to expose the nonsense that much of the literary left believed about science. In particular, its lax notions about how scientific knowledge was historical. To this end, he contrived a patently in inane essay that hailed the cultural studies muckamucks. I structured the article, so Cal explained to the New York Times, around the silliest quotes about mathematics and physics from the most prominent cultural studies academics, and I invented an argument praising them and linking them together. He added that this was easy to do, for he ignored standards of evidence and logic. Social text loved it. Afterward, editors and other supporters scrambled to make the best of the situation. They denounced SoCal, claimed he was half-educated or simply blustered. The editors of Social Text, Bruce Robbins and Andrew Ross, who in publishing the piece demonstrated they know nothing about science, charged that SoCal is threatened by cultural studies, as if the threat were the denunciation of shabby scholarship, not the shabby scholarship itself. In my view, the hoax affected such intense feelings of resentful glee precisely because it crystallized a large, important fault line in the post-socialist condition, stated Nancy Fraser, as if this illuminated anything. Sokal's hoax is a form of acting out, opined Homi K. Baba. I detect in Sokal's essay, in his rhetorical strategies, in his linguistic constructions, a displaced anxiety about the contested autonomy of science. Stanley Fish, executor director of Duke University Press, which publishes social text, defended his editors. They all believe in the real world and its historical context in the same way they view baseball as both real and historical. Who could doubt that baseball is a historical construct? But are the laws of physics that sustain it also historical, even imperialist? It is almost as if fish were to astound everyone, grumbled Martin Gardner, a science writer, by declaring ah, that fish are not part of nature, but only cultural constructs. Pressed for clarification of such a bizarre view, he would then clear the air by explaining that he wasn't referring to real fish out there in real water, but only to the word fish. With deep misgivings about universals, an unwillingness to judge on the basis of them, and a trite notion of history, leftist intellectuals drift into a major current of conservatism that includes Burkean traditionalism, German romanticism, and American regionalism. All repudiate abstract and uniform systems of thought usually associated with the French Enlightenment and champion the particular and the different. To classify these currents simply as conservative would be inaccurate. <clears throat> A suspicion... Sorry. Oh, lost my spot again. A suspicion of universals has been embraced by various schools of thought, including liberal American pragmatism and English empiricism. William James's 1909... 1909 lectures titled A Pluralistic Universe offered 300 pages defending the particular and unique form or from an all embracing monism. Plural pro fuck. <coughs> Pluralism means that things are with one another in many ways, but nothing includes everything or dominates over everything. The progressive and regressive elements of this orientation intermingle. Inasmuch as the individual is defended against an oppressive totality, the approach breathes of liberation, which surfaced in Romanticism. 
a bracing protest at the support nation and often sacrifice of the individual to the wider system, infused 18th century romanticism. In the entire history of thought, wrote Arthur O. Lovejoy in his classic The Great Chain of Being. There have been few changes of standards of value more profound and more momentous than Romanticism. Lovejoy cited the 18th century theologian Frederick Schleiermacher to illustrate the new sensibility. A disdain for homogeneity <clears throat> and an appreciation of individuality. Why does this pitiable uniformity prevail, which seeks to turn to which seeks to bring oh my eyes, which seeks to bring the highest human life within the compass of a single lifeless formula? Asked Schleiermacher. How can <clears throat> how can this ever have come into vogue except in consequence of a radical lack of feeling for the fundamental characteristic of living nature, which everywhere aims at diversity and individuality? With his attack on the dogmatizing love of system, which excludes all difference, Schleiermacher sounds intellectually sounds intellectually up to date. He intuited that the drive to uniformity feeds violence. This miserable love of system rejects what is strange, because were it to receive a place, the closed ranks would be destroyed and the beautiful coherence disturbed. The system mania is the seat of the art and love of strife. War must be carried on and persecution. These systematizers, therefore, have caused it all. The adherents of the dead letter have filled the world with clamor and turmoil. Yet Lovejoy, who applauded the new appreciation of individual diversity, also registered the danger where the radical elements turn suspect. Praise of a prolific multiplicity was not selective, and the revolt against standardization of life easily becomes a revolt against the whole conception of standards. The love of diversity, he wrote in the early 1930s, has lent itself all too easily to the service of man's egotism, and especially in the political and social sphere, of a kind of collective vanity, which is nationalism or racialism. Exactly. The exactly is actually written there. That wasn't me saying that. <clears throat> the flat rejection of the universal leads to the rote affirmation of the unique and specific. History becomes the great excuse. This train of thought inexorably becomes conservative inasmuch as it sabotages the general propositions required to judge. Once writers and scholars isolate local conditions from universal categories, they lose the ability to evaluate them. They become cheerleaders, nationalists, and chauvinists. With equal enthusiasm, Rajani K. Kanth, in Breaking with the Enlightenment, denounces the fraud of Western universalism and touts non-Western localism. In Euro-capitalist societies, people demonize each other with broad categories. In the non-Western world, people tie to each other by kinship, affinity, and affection, as for instance in tribal forms, are incapable and unwilling to abstractly demonize their fellows. Does this prevent them from murdering each other? That war, violence, slavery, and caste are not Western monopolies, and that they do not improve when rooted in local situations do not seem to occur to Kant. Scholars often point to German historicism as a classic case of a tradition that began scorning universals and ended up upholding a virulent nationalism. The title of an essay by Justice Moser an 18th century historicist concisely captures the approach. 
The modern taste for general laws and decrees is a danger to our common liberty. From Moser to the 20th century nationalists, historicists claim that universals violated the complexity and variety of the German reality. They defended a unique German reality against the universalism of Western Europe. For instance, in the midst of World War I, Ernst Trolsch, an esteemed theologian, rallied to the cause contrasting German distinctiveness to the European abstraction of a universal and equal humanity. The same distrust of universals pervaded American regionalists and conservatives. It is not by chance that American slavery became known by its defenders as the peculiar institution, peculiar inasmuch as it diverged from the universal rights established elsewhere. Similar reasoning surfaced in exponents of American regionalism. For instance, the agrarians who defended a Southern life against industrialism and progressivism in their 1930 classic book, I'll take my stand. Recent regionalists returned to the same principles, upholding local and perhaps unjust realities against the abstract universals. Unlike the America of the New World Order, runs a statement by the Southern League, a conservative group headquartered in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The League is wedded not to a universal proposition, democracy or the rights of man, but to a real past of place and kin. The League supports a return to a political and social system based on allegiance to kith and kin, rather than to an impersonal state wedded to the idea of the universal rights of man. A, particular, a, a particularism that scorns universals inevitably ends by celebrating blood and race. The Dreyfus case again offers the classic example. Maurice Berez, an anti-Dreyfusard, denounced intellectuals as logicians of the absolute. He considered them deracinated internationalists who trade in abstractions like justice and truth and who no longer spontaneously feel any rapport with the nation. The next step seemed obvious. Dreyfus was Jewish. Many of his supporters were Jewish. Deracinated Jews and intellectuals trade in abstractions. For us, stated Barris, the nation is our soil and our ancestors. It is the land of our dead. For the Jewish intellectuals, on the other hand, nationalism is an idea or a prejudice to destroy. <clears throat> oh, awesome. Um, no. Okay, we're good. The same sentiment animated German reactionaries like Ernst von Salomon, who, who assassinated the Jewish industrialist Rathenau in the first years of the Weimar Republic. The intellectual speaks and writes, I. He feels no connectedness. He causes disintegration. The emphatic we of the new generation is a clear renunciation of intellectualism. The we of the young nationalist generation is tied to blood. Vanguard thinkers return to primal ideas, doubting any concepts that go beyond blood and place. Truth becomes truth, reason becomes reason, human rights, human rights. The quotation marks signify the subjective quality as said by, context is everything, truth is nothing. Today, few could speak the language of the enlightenment. We hold these truths to be self-evident. For today's scholars, these words hide as much as they state. No truth no truths are self-evident. They are constructed and invented. They emerge at specific times and places. These are truths of 18th century Europe and America. And who is the we? A bunch of white patricians? All the constituting notions of enlightenment metanarratives have been exposed, writes a feminist political thinker Jane Flax, referring to concepts like reason and history. True and false are themselves obsolete, since truth is always contextual. These platitudes enjoy great success, as Luc Ferry and Alain Renaud write of recent French philosophy. If the truth must be shattered, if there are no facts but only interpretations, if all references to universal norms are inevitably catastrophic, then what remains but authenticity, whatever its content may be? Yet it must be insisted upon. The universal also has its claims. 
even or exactly the protest of the individual against a political system taps into universal rights and equalities. Without these universals, which weaken in the face of appeals to localism and authenticity, the opposition crumbles. In the name of universals, the protest not only protests, but affirms a world beyond de degradation and unhappiness. It hints of utopia. Herbert Marcuse's most visionary work, his 1955 Eros and Civilization, brought out the links between utopia, protest, and universal categories. During the 1960s, Marcuse championed what he dubbed the absolute refusal, a call to individuals to refuse cooperation with a deadly economic and social system. Despite its political and activist accents, the term absolute refusal originated in his philosophical work, Eros and Civilization, where Marcuse explored the utopian dimensions of art and imagination. Drawing upon the Surrealists, Marcuse argued that in repudiating a narrow realism, imagination, and fantasy nurtured their own truths. <clears throat> in its... <clears throat> In his refusal to ac accept final limitations to freedom and happiness and his refusal to forget what can be lies the critical function of fantasy. Imagination transcends the limited reality to glimpse its latent possibilities. It comprehends reality more fully uh, than realism. Conversely, on behalf of constricted reality, imagination is damned as untrue. Marcuse compressed his analysis into what he called the Great Refusal. The Great Refusal is the protest against unnecessary repression. The struggle for the ultimate form of freedom to live without anxiety. But this idea could be formulated without punishment only in the language of art. In realistic philosophy and politics, the idea of life without anxiety would be defamed as utopia. <clears throat> Marcuse derived the phrase the Great Refusal, which simultaneously invoked protest and utopia from a discussion of universals by Alfred North Whitehead. The English-American philosopher held that universals in art and criticism transcend their particular cases. His language is a bit sticky, but the argument is clear. Every actual occurrence must be set within an abstract realm that transcends it. To be abstract is to transcend particular concrete occasions of actual happening. To transcend does not mean to be disconnected. Indeed, the exact relationship of the universal and concrete is crucial. Any particular red flower falls short of the universal red by which we judge it. Yet the universal is not false. The truth that some proposition respecting an actual occasion is untrue may express the vital truth as to the aesthetic achievement. It expresses the great refusal, which is its primary characteristic. An event is decisive in proportion to the importance for it of its untrue propositions. These transcendent entities have been termed universals. The logic sticks in the craw of empiricists, postmodernists, and most leftists. Metaphysical universals inhere in the world but transcend it. An individual event may be untrue in that it, in that it is contradicted by reality, but this untruth expresses its achievement or different truth, its basis in metaphysical principles. To shift political philosophy, the argument parallels the logic of the opening of Rousseau's social contract. Man is born free and everywhere is in chains. To conventional logic and leftists, these statements are wildly contradictory, untrue, or meaningless. How can man be metaphysically free and empirically unfree? As the skeptic in Alexander Hertzins from the other shore commented, the proposition shows contempt for the facts. Why do all things exist as they should, while man alone does not? Rousseau might well have said fish are born to fly, but everywhere swim under water. Yet the logic in Whitehead and Rousseau bespeaks the logic of negativity. Although the first statement, the universal, is contradicted by the reality of the second, by the domain of empirical reality, it retains its truth. From here, it is not a great leap to everyday politics and protest. Those who know nothing of the argument of the great refusal often instinctively accept it as the historic basis of protest. 
In refusing cooperation with this society, the great refusal contains an affirmation of a better one. Conversely, despite the political posture of subversiveness, a casual rejection of universals as imperialist undermines the drive for a different world. Eugene Genevieve, the historian, reminds us how 4th of July celebrations caused problems in the slave South. During these events, the glaring disjuncture between the idiom of universal freedom found in the Declaration of Independence and the fact of slavery gave rise to uneasiness. In the North, abolitionists and ex-slaves appealed to its principles in daily violation. Once every year in this land of the free on Freedom's Natal Day, stated a black petitioner to the Boston legislature in 1853, the people assemble in public convocation and in intonations loud and long proclaim to the despotism of the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident. But, con but, continued William J. Watkins, your laws are founded in caste, conceived in caste, born in caste. Caste in the God whom this great nation delights to honor, he thundered, give us our rights, treat us like men, carry out the principles of your immortal declaration. <coughs> it was and is tempting to dismiss the festivities and its principles as bogus. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? thundered Frederick Douglass in his 1852 speech, the meaning of July 4th for the Negro. I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the, re in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery. This might sound very modern, a ringing attack on Western universals as frauds. On closer inspection, however, it is almost the opposite, a denunciation of the reality in the name of the ideas. Douglas damns slavery for betraying the ideas of liberty, not the ideas for betraying African Americans. The denunciation of the 4th of July as hypocrisy appeals to the idea of equality. It bemoans the gap between the claim and reality. Like other abolitionists, Douglas drew encouragement from the great principles of the Declaration of Independence, and he saw them spreading throughout the world. No longer can established customs of hurtful character do their evil with, with social impunity. No abuse, no outrage, whether in taste, sport, or avarice, can now hide itself from the all-pervading light. Fifty years later, Emil Zola stated, I have but one desire, seeing the light in the name of humanity. All this sounds naive. What light? What principles? What humanity? Today, the new generation of critics sees through this stuff. They also see less.